Hello everyone, um, welcome to this workshop um, on syllabus creation and course preparation. My name is Carol, uh, Dr. Carol Bishop Mills and I am in the Department of Communication Studies. I'm an associate professor there. I teach in the areas of human communication. Specifically, I study personal relationships, teasing and bullying, and health communication. And this is my third year doing this workshop and we've made some big tweaks to it and hopefully it will meet your needs. Before we get started, I want to ask you a few questions so I know who I'm talking with today or speaking with. How many of you have never taught before in your lives? Please raise your hands. Okay. How many of you have been a GTA and supported somebody in a teaching capacity before? Okay, very good. So how many veteran teachers do I have in here then? Probably should have quite a few. Excellent. So as you guys can see, hopefully looking around, there is a mixed crowd here. So some of this information will be really applicable to you. Some you may not even need yet. Some you may go, ooh, I know that. Some of it, however, is very specific to the UA system. And even if you taught here two or three years ago, it may be a little different. Okay. Now, I'm not going to make you raise your hand and answer this question. But how many of you, and don't raise your hand again, please don't. How many of you in here believe that maybe somewhere along the line somebody made a mistake and you don't actually belong here? Mm -hmm. How many of you think that once you start teaching or taking graduate classes, somebody might figure out that you snuck through and really should have never been accepted? Right? The reality is the imposter syndrome let's see if I can make this work, is actually incredibly common. And so if you're thinking you're the only one feeling that way, please don't. Start today knowing that even after teaching for 20 some odd years now, I still wake up some days and go, wow, they're going to realize I shouldn't be doing this. Or I'll get a publication accepted and I'll go, wow, do they realize that I probably didn't say anything that I was supposed to say in that article? What were they thinking? The peer review process has failed. The imposter syndrome is common. And there are ways of getting around it and making it manageable. And a lot of that really is in your preparation. And so today, those are going to be the kinds of things hopefully I can help you focus on is the preparation aspect. Because when I start doubting myself, it's generally in my biggest moments of disorganization. When I realize I've kind of let things go. So at the end of this workshop today, you should know how to create a syllabus. Understand the key components. And at Alabama, those key components are somewhat different. Understand the importance of planning and preparation. And hopefully, when you leave here, you'll be a little bit more confident that you can and will be a very good GTA. So I want to talk very briefly about your role. Um, many of you in here might be on the social science side of things. How many of you are on the social science side of things? Raise your hand. Okay. So a lot of you are probably familiar with Irving Goffman. And he tells us that our self arises in interactions with other people. But in doing that, it means that we are responsible for managing our impressions that we have on other people. All of you can think about a professor or a teacher that has made a big difference in your life, can't you? Right, mine's a fourth grade teacher and then a professor that taught the class, the subject I hated more in, in college than any other subject, but I loved that professor. It's why I'm in graduate school now. All of us can think about those people that made a real difference in our lives. Can you think about those teachers or professors you wish you never, ever had to encounter even once? Yes, you can. Those behaviors that they sent out to you when they were teaching were not by mistake. Right? They were reflections of how they chose to run their classroom. Those are reflections of how they chose to teach. And right now, before this semester begins, you have the ability to choose who you are going to be in that classroom. When those students walk in, they don't know you. They don't know what you're bringing to that class. It is your responsibility and your duty to show them who you are, how you want to be treated, and how you will be treating them. It is not going to happen by accident. And if you let it happen by accident, what is going to happen? What, go ahead. How is it going to happen? What, 
sloppily? Are they going to like you? And more importantly than whether or not they like you, are they going to learn anything? No. Okay. Because whether or not they like you, that we want to be liked, but that is not nearly as important as doing your job and having students learn. And in this role, there are three things that are critical that you have in making sure you do your job well. The first is knowledge. Now the reality is, is how many of you are a little bit afraid of the class that you're teaching that maybe somebody in the class will know a little bit more than you? Yeah, sometimes you might have that fear, okay? So what do you do? You prepare, and you prepare a lot. And if ever they ask you a question that you don't know the answer to, should you make up the answer? No, no matter how tempting it is, right? Because the best way to show your lack of knowledge is to create something that is easily verifiable or easily shown to be incorrect. It is OK to say, that's a fantastic question. Let me do some research and get back with you on that. That is OK to say. The second key component, and I think everyone in this room can identify this, with this, is fairness. Fairness. How many of you have ever had a teacher or professor that gave preferential treatment to some people in that class or you felt as if they did? Have you had that experience? Do you like it? Then don't do it. It's that simple. But it's so easy to do because you say, she seems so nice. I know that that was a deadline and I know I said I had a penalty, but she was so nice and her it just, oh, I hate to say no to her, right? Be careful. Giving extra credit to some students and not other students. Easiest way to land yourself in a great appeal. Okay? Be fair. Okay? You can create flexible policies and still be fair, but be fair. And above all, be organized. And this is what the syllabus that we're going to talk about will help you do. Now, I will be honest, there are semesters that I'm not very organized, not as organized as I need to be. And in those semesters, even if I'm as charismatic and fabulous as I think I am, my teaching evaluations will plummet. If I, tell, if I give students a test and I can't give that test back for three or four weeks, do you think my evaluations are going to be very good? Uh-uh. If I give students a paper and I assign a paper like a week later, and they're turning in a second paper before they got feedback on their first paper, do you think students are going to be thrilled? No, because it shows lack of foresight on my part to have assignments due before they've gotten feedback on the first one. And think about that. When you are teaching, right, you need to be thinking about what works pedagogically, not just what works for your schedule. Because the reality is, is many of you are going to be in programs where they say your research is the most important thing. Your research is important if you're a doctoral student. But you also have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, however many students, depending on you, to help them learn material that you are supposedly passionate about or you would not be in that graduate program. So above all, be organized. OK. A syllabus. You guys have seen these for years. And in fact, I don't know how many of you read Al.com this morning, but there was a story in L.com about a Homewood High School math teacher and his syllabus. Did any of you see it? A few of you did. What did you see? What were they talking about? Yeah, he said, you know, if you expect not to have homework, you're in the wrong class. You're going to have homework every day. Don't be lazy. What else did he say? Don't fall asleep in his class or I will do what? Exactly. I'll humiliate you. I'll send pictures. I'll give them to your families. Right? Does anybody remember what else he said? Anybody? He did several things like that. He said, don't get up and sharpen your pencil during the middle of an exam. It's distracting and I will let other students humiliate you if you do it. Okay? It's funny. That is actually my child's high school math teacher. Does that work in high school? 
I think so. That's why I moved to that particular school district. My kid needs that kind of challenge. Is that necessarily appropriate for a college level syllabus? No. Right? You're dealing with adults. Okay? And you need to be thinking about that. Even though they're going to be freshmen, most likely, they're still young adults. Okay? And you need to be thinking the kind of respect you want to be treated with. You need to treat other people with the same kind of respect. You start by providing a vision and rationale for the class. Okay? Students need to know what you want out of that class, what it means why that class is important. That's all in your head. Put it on the syllabus. Let them know why this class is important. How many of you are teaching classes that are in the core curriculum or that students may be taking because they have to, not because they want to? Raise your hands. A lot of you. So what happens in that first day is critical to whether they buy into that course is being a good learning experience. Like I said, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing as a professor is a class that the content I hated, but the professor was so clear about the goals of that class. She was so incredibly organized that I realized academics were what I wanted to do. Okay? So don't just think, uh, they may not like the topic. Because if you like the topic, and hopefully you do if you're graduate students in that topic, it will be contagious. Okay? So plan on that. Provide a logic and organization for the course. Make sure that the students know why the course is flowing the way it is. Okay? Make sure they know why things move the way they do. Don't be afraid to say, you know, when we are covering art history, the best way to go is chronological. Well, that might make sense in your head, but they may not get that. Right? Or, you know, if you're teaching a biology class and you're jumping from topic to topic, let them know why so that they can, in their heads, figure out what comes next. How many of you have ever just not liked that feeling of, oh, this seems so random? Don't know why it's happening. Right? So provide that kind of logic and organization. The other thing that is incredibly helpful in the syllabus, let students know right up front what your expectations are in terms of assignments, activities, policies, and schedules. And we'll go through this a little bit step by step. But students need to know what to expect that first day of class. Okay? They need to know, you know, if you do use rubrics, go ahead and put them in the syllabus if you have them ready. If you are teaching an English class, even though you think it might make sense to let them know, or that it might make sense that they should know that they're being graded on grammar and spelling, you might actually want to put that in the syllabus. Because even in communication, I have students say, well, are you going to count off for spelling? How do you communicate effectively if I don't know what it is you're trying to say to me? Okay? But those things help. Also discuss the mutual responsibilities of the instructor and students. You're giving them everything that you want them to do. Let them know what you're going to do. Right? Let them know when you turn in an assignment, I will always give it back within two weeks. You know, after an exam, let them know. Let them know what your office hours are. Let them know what to expect from you. It reduces that uncertainty. And when we have less uncertainty, we tend to like the person and the subject more. Right? It doesn't have us discombobulated. Think about ways to allow students to have high degrees of personal control over their learning. Okay? If they know when things are coming up, they can decide to work ahead. If there's a big paper at the end, right, you might want to talk to them in the syllabus about getting an early start on it so that they're not waiting until the last minute. You might even want to have smaller deadlines so that they feel like they've got things to achieve. Nothing is worse, and I will tell you this from personal experience on both the teaching side and on the student side, and I know all of you know this. Have you ever had anybody who ambush graded? Which means you don't really have anything that's worth much do until the final week or two of class. So you go into the final exam or the final paper, right? The final exam and the final paper combined are like 75% of the course grade. How does that make you feel? Pretty scared, huh? Right? 
So you should set things up so that students feel like they have some control over what's happening. So that when they go into the final exam or go into the final paper, they know, I need to get a 90 whatever on this to get an A. I know I need to do a really good paper in order to even pass this class. Don't have your class wondering, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Right? And that goes back to that organization. And remember, that syllabus serves as a contract for learning. So you can't just change things without updating that contract. One of the reasons that on my day, uh, tentative schedule or my daily schedule, I always put tentative daily schedule. And if I make any changes, I make sure to alert the class in several ways. And you have to make sure that if it's a contract and you're changing it, you let them know. You don't want to open yourself up to grade appeals on something like that. OK, so let's look at a UA syllabus. We have several requirements. Um, on page, what page was that, Lenny? 47? Uh, 49. On page 49, you have a sample syllabus. Okay. This came from Dr. Reed's BSC 442 class. Okay. Notice what is on there. Okay. You should always have your office hours and contacts. The prerequisites will get populated automatically. Okay. Then you have a course description. And this is what I was talking about. Notice that she tells you this is an advanced discovery-based laboratory course designed to introduce the processes of gene discovery and integrate modern genomic techniques and bioinformatics database usage. The advanced undergraduate level course will introduce you to major technologies and concepts familiarize yourself, right? And you can see she goes through what that class is about. And when students read that description, they should know, oh, okay. And after looking at the prerequisites and that, they can decide if they belong in there or they don't belong in there. Do you understand why that's important? Right? You need to have that good description in there. But just as importantly, is what is underneath this, okay? Um, on the next page, on page 50, she has student learning goals or student learning outcomes. And this I actually want to spend a moment on with you. These need to be very, very, very active. What is it that your students should be able to know and do when they leave your classroom? So not, students are going to know more about human communication. Students are going to be able to have better relationships. Students are going to be able to, what does that mean? Right? How do you put that into concrete terms? So let's look at her student objectives, her student learning outcomes. They are incredibly clear. At the conclusion of this course, you should be able to describe the basic methodologies of the major technologies in genomics and systems biology. So from day one, what do students know they're going to have to be able to do by the end of that course? That. They know they're going to have to demonstrate understanding of the general concepts underlying genome sequencing and annotation. Okay? They know they're going to have to do all of these things including write a properly cited literature-based Wikipedia entry and demonstrate improved oral performance skills. She has outlined very specific things that every one of them will be able to do. And they're concrete and they're measurable and students know these are things I'm going to have to do. So right now I would like you all to, on the side of your paper, the best you can, because many of you may not have even seen your textbooks that you're using yet, but write down what you think a few very clear student learning objectives would be coming out of the class that you are going to be teaching. And if you're TAing, you know, what you think they might be. So just take a stab at it and let's see if we can do that in an active way. Okay. Let's go ahead and see if we can write a few learning objectives down. Okay, does everybody have at least one or two written down? Okay, can somebody please share with me one that you have written? 
Thanks. Thank you. What class are you going to be teaching? Okay, Spanish 101, one of the probably most common classes on campus. So tell me one of your learning objectives. To learn Spanish? I have conjugate, regular, and irregular error verbs. Excellent. To be able to conjugate irregular and irregular AR verbs. How is that different than to learn Spanish? It's specific. Students will know they need to be able to conjugate those verbs. Excellent. May I have another one, please? Probably discuss slash describe the use of a phishing scam. Of a phishing scam. Yeah. Okay. Not, what? Not slash I know what you. <laughs> yeah, I assume. Yeah. So, what are you going to be teaching? Cybersecurity warfare. Cybersecurity. Excellent. Right. So, be able to say that one more time. Be able to probably discuss slash describe the use of a phishing scam. Excellent. Right. So, be able to discuss and describe the use of a phishing scam. Right. So, students will know this is something I need to know about before I leave this class. Excellent. Give me another one. Pretty please. Yes. Um, students will be able to critically assess student health communication and popular media. Okay, terrific. What class are you going to be teaching? Personal health. Okay, personal health. And what department is that in? Health science. Health science. So say that one more time. Be able to? Critically assess health communication and popular media. Okay, be able to critically assess health communication and popular media. Okay. And you might even want to think about, like, are there ways to even break that, uh, that down a little bit more? Because do students always know what critically assess means, right? So think about the way students will think about that, right? That is an awesome, awesome start, right? And so do you see what I'm saying here? Do you see how, like, you do these things and they allow students then to say, these are the things I need to focus on? And as we'll talk about on a later slide, one of my biggest lessons I've ever learned is knowing ahead of time what the most important concepts I want to teach are. Not just here's a textbook and I'm going to cover chapters 1 through 15 because we have 15 weeks of class, but what are those big things, right? If you want them to be able to critically assess health communication campaigns in the media, right? How do we get there, right? Um, these objectives are also really important because although as graduate students you may not see this quite yet, assessment and accreditation is becoming increasingly important in the lives of academics at the college and university level. And you know, the people who oversee universities want to know. SACS is on the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, right? So you know, you know you're going to an accredited university. What does that mean? It means that SACS looks at us and makes sure that when our students leave, they actually know more than when they came in. Right? Having learning objectives makes it possible to see then are we teaching and helping students get to that learning objective. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Um, the other thing that is incredibly important is an outline of topics. Okay. You know, what is it that you are going to be doing? And I want to actually do that by logging on to a blank syllabus. Has everybody seen, hold on one second, why is this mouse not working? Has everybody gone on to see how you create a syllabus in MyBama? Has everybody done this yet? Okay, then let me go back one step because this is incredibly important. When you log on to MyBama, okay, you will go to your faculty tab. Okay? On your faculty tab, you will have this little box that says OIRA resources. Every person who teaches a class at this university, now if you're GTAing for somebody, your head professor is probably doing this, but if you are responsible for writing a syllabus, it has to be in this system. Gone are the days where you simply type up a syllabus and hand it out to your students and nobody knows what it says but you and the students. The university needs to have access to everyone's syllabus, a syllabi, syllabi, right? Depending on if you're Greek or Latin, I guess. But you, they have to have access. I'm serious. I have a department chair who says syllabi, and I've never heard it that way, but it, apparently it's the Greek pronunciation instead of the Latin. But you have to be able to get them into this system. So you go to OIRA resources, and then, wait, where did it, hold on. Um, click here to access, and then you go to online syllabus management. And you click on online syllabus management. 
And if you are scheduled to teach a class, your list of classes will come up. So these are the classes I taught this summer. Okay. These are the classes, this, these two classes are the ones I'll be teaching this fall. When you open it up, you will see what is pre-populated. The course name, the section number, your name are pre-populated. I will have to put in my course, my office hours, and contact information. In there, not only can you put you know, your office number, your contact information, but it is helpful also to think about things you want students to know when they contact you. The easiest way to contact me is by email. Or, you know, contact me only through um, UA's Blackboard Learn system. So instead of putting your email, you may want to keep everything in Blackboard Learn and say, so email me through Blackboard Learn. And you guys all know what that is, right? Hopefully, like, they're even using stuff like that in high schools now, but the online learning systems. You may want them to contact you mainly through there. A lot of people like to give out their cell phone numbers. I would say do that very wisely. I mean, really think about if you want to go there because you will have students texting you at all hours of the day and night. And when someone texts you, they expect a response in five minutes. I don't think that that is the best way to go, but more power to you if that's how you operate. Right? But think about that. Also let them know, I will respond to your emails within however long. And I say this only to help you. I'm not kidding when I say every once in a while I will have a student who emails me and an hour and a half later go, did you get my email? I apparently did, but I was teaching for a three hour block. I did not get to it. So you might want to say all emails, do you do that, right? Or you've had that happen, right? So you may want to say all emails will be responded to within 12 hours or 24 hours. Beyond 24 hours is a little silly. Um, but you know, I will respond to all emails within 12 hours. If you haven't heard of, you know, from me after 12 hours, please feel free to initiate a second contact in case I miss it. Right? But let them know how to contact you. Okay? Then, you know, I'm teaching a class that has no prerequisites. I'm teaching family communication. If it had any prereqs, they would be loaded in there. Okay? Um, the UA catalog description, um, it, it's a special topic, so there's nothing in there right now. But I need to go in and explain to students, like we talked about, what is the description of my course? The catalog one is short, but giving them more information is even more helpful. Okay. Then I need to put in my student learning outcomes. right? And because it's family communication, I need to think about what are the key things that I want my students to know about family communication. Okay. Then the required textbooks. If it has been ordered through the soup store, hopefully all of yours have been by now, that will automatically populate. I will tell you that you need to be incredibly careful. Even if you think you want it to be optional, go ahead and put it as required because student athletes and scholarship students are oftentimes not able to use their funding to get books that are optional. So if you really want your students to have them, put them down as required or, like I said, scholarship students and student athletes may not be able to use their funds to get those books, right? A strange little quirk in the system, I guess, okay? Um, and then there are the severe weather guidelines, okay? Um, and the disability statement and the policies on academic misconduct that are already going to be on there. I also urge you to think about adding to that weather statement what you are going to do in the case of severe emergency. Think about your own backup plans for teaching if something happens. So, you know, we had, as many of you know, because I'm assuming some of you were here on April 27, three years ago, when we had a tornado that ended up canceling basically the end of the semester. Right? A lot of us did not have in place contingency plans. And the town had no electricity anyway, but you know, for things like snowmageddon that we had last year, right? You know, luckily, you know, classes were not in session at that time. But if they had been in session, what do you do? How many of you are teaching a class that you know if you lose a week or two, catching back up is going to be nearly impossible? Raise your hands. 
hopefully a few of you. Some of you, you know, might have a little bit more flexibility. But you need to be thinking about, even if, you know, school classes are canceled, I will put up lectures that you will need to, re to watch before that next class. I will have assignments that are due. Let them know that ahead of time if you're going to be doing that. And you should be thinking about that because it's incredibly important. Same kind of thing in terms of planning for contingencies, not just in severe weather, but what happens if you get sick? What happens if you can't make class? What is your backup plan? Gone are the days where, I don't know if anybody in this room is close to my age, but back in my day, if a professor missed class, students were like, yay! And I went to the University of Miami, so beach day, right? Um, and so, you know, missing class, we were happy if the professor missed a class or two. Gone are those days. Parents and students are investing a significant amount of money in their students' education. They want their professors and teachers to be there. So if you aren't going to be there, what can you do to still have class? Do you have a teaching buddy? Somebody who can jump in who's teaching the same class that you can kind of tag team and they can come in and do the lecture that day. Can you have something ready to go on Blackboard Learn? Can you have an activity that one of your colleagues who may not be teaching that class can run on those days? Right. Remember we talked about organization being critical. It also means kind of planning for those contingencies so you don't have to, and here's the thing, you know, last semester I ended up with pneumonia. I could not go to class for over a week and a half. And as soon as that was done, I had a herniated disc. I had a great healthy semester. But, you know, what did I do in that week and a half? Am I allowed to just go, geez, I'm not going to teach for a week and a half. Students, it's your responsibility to teach yourself for a week and a half. You can't do that. You need to have that backup plan. So when you're thinking about severe weather guidelines, also be thinking about that. Then you have, like I said, the disability statement. I cannot encourage you enough on the first day of class, when you go through the syllabus, don't just skip it, but let students know if you need accommodations, please let me know as soon as possible because I can't go back and give you accommodations once you've already turned in an assignment or an exam. Last year I was working as associate dean and we had a lot of students who would come in who didn't do so well in a class because they were embarrassed to use their disability accommodation. And so one of the things you can do up front when you're going over the syllabus with students is to remind them that you are supportive of their needs for their services that they're legally entitled to by the um, ADA. And so let them know, please come up and I will handle it very confidentially, but I would love it if no student in this room was afraid to use their accommodations. Reach out to those students. And you know, make sure that they're using, you can't make sure that they're using their accommodations, but let them know that you're open to them using those accommodations because oftentimes students get scared. They're afraid that they're going to be stigmatized in that class. And you want to make sure that nobody feels that way. How many of you in your families have somebody who has some kind of learning disability that requires some kind of accommodation? From ADHD to dyslexia, right? You wouldn't want those family members and friends feeling like they couldn't get those accommodations. So again, you can add to this disability statement that you're supportive of their needs to do that and we'll work with them. So just because they're pre-populated doesn't mean that you, don't, that you don't have the ability to tinker with it. And also the policy on academic misconduct is on here already. Okay? And you can think about whether or not you would like to add to that a little bit, right? And let them know kind of how you will, you know, be very vigilant about making sure that these policies are upheld. Everybody got that? Okay. So does looking through that syllabus help a little bit? Okay. So you have this sample syllabus here, right? And then you now have looked at the one and how you do it online. Okay. Now, what happens if you say, well, geez, I'm not teaching in biology, and I would love to see some learning outcomes, even though we've written a few, I'd love to see some more learning outcomes in my field. How do you get those? How can you look at additional learning outcomes? Yes, right. Go talk to those people that are teaching those courses already. You can go talk to the professors in that department, the other GTAs. And remember how I said we all have to put our syllabi on this system, right? That means that you can also see other syllabi on this system. 
Okay, why is this mouse playing with me? Here we go. Oops, I've got to log back in. If you log back in, and you guys have all seen how you register for classes just like you do, if you go to class schedule, you can see the syllabi for courses in the previous semesters that are just like the ones you've taught. So that might help you generate some ideas as well. Make sense? Okay. Let's get back to this PowerPoint. Slideshow from current slideshow. Okay. So you've got your learning goals, your outline of topics. Why do student, why should you have an outline of topics? Why should you let students know what topics are going to be covered in that class? So they know what to prepare for. Exactly. So they know what to prepare for, right? I mean, like I said, I can't just say I'm teaching family communication because I'm assuming that everybody in here thinks if I'm teaching family communication, you know what I'm teaching about. Right? It may be very different. That outline of topics helps them look forward. Right? Um, your attendance policy. What is the university's attendance policy? Mandatory? No. Yeah, the university does not have a set attendance policy. Now, your departments might have one they suggest. Your colleges might have one they suggest. Find out if there's one that works best in your department or in your college. But you need to think about what that attendance policy is going to be. You need to think about if it's, like you said, with classes, you know, if you, if you teach three times a week, more than three absences. If you teach two times a week, more than two absences. And what that will mean. You can't just say, I'm teaching this class, and if you don't come, there will be a penalty. Do they need to know what that penalty will be for your attendance policy? Yes, they do. And having worked um, in the associate's dean's office last year in the College of Communication and Information Sciences, I can tell you that even if it's on your syllabus, students are going to not like it at the end of the semester when you say, if you miss more than three classes, you will lose a half of a letter grade. But can they appeal the grade based on that if it's in your syllabus? No. So think about that and make sure that you put that in your syllabus. So let's see next page here. OK. Planned number and timing of major assignments. The planned number of assignments. Why is that important? Why should students be able to pick up this syllabus and say, I am going to have, you know, four assignments? So if you look at this syllabus, okay, um, on page 51, it says, see class schedule for more details. Okay, see class schedule for more details, but it has the major ones on here, doesn't it? Right? It has that they're going to be lab exercises. It has that they're going to have their Wikipedia page entry and presentation. It has that they're going to have their annotation project and presentation. And it also has the dates already for the midterm and the final. Why is that useful to have the planned number and the timing for the assignments on there, especially those like the midterm and final? Exactly. Students can plan out their semester and their schedule and their studying time. And it is, will not be uncommon for you to have students say in the first week, oh my goodness, I'm going to have four exams on the same day. Right? That gives them time to figure it out, to plan, to figure out if they need to move any. If you're saying, oh, when we get to the midterm time, all oh, we'll have an exam sometime. What does that not allow students to do? Plan. To plan. Right? And so, you know, that gives them kind of a heads up, essentially. In addition, it also lets them know how many things they're going to have to prepare for. It gives them a sense of how many things they're going to have to prepare for. Okay. And then you've got the grading policy here, right? And this is really well done, right? It explains right away to students, right? Um, the policy here, you know, the presentation is going to be 20%, the wet lab is 10%, the annotation project is 20%, right? And this allows students the ability to say, if I have to drop one thing, or if I can't do everything perfectly, where am I going to put my effort? Well, geez, if this is worth 20%, where do I need to know I need to put most of my effort, right? So give students that kind of information. 
And again, if you happen to have rubrics that you've developed or assignments, you can put those in there as well. Right? The required text and other material is on that first page. I showed you that that populates. And then the academic misconduct and disability statement. All of that needs to be on your syllabus. Are you allowed to put other things on your syllabus? Yes. What other things might you want to put on your syllabus? Come on. You know these things. What kinds of things do you think you might want on your syllabus? Study sessions. Yes. If you're going to host study sessions or they are available to students, absolutely. Do all of you know that the university has a center for teaching excellence? Uh, what is it called? The Center for Academic Success. Right? It's basically a tutoring and studying resource on campus. You might want to put something like that on there. Or if you're having study sessions, good. What else might you want to put on there? Yes? Cell phone policy. Cell phone policy. Absolutely. Let students know what your cell phone policy is. Now, have all of you seen the awesome YouTube video from about a year ago where the professor had the policy that um, in class, if the phone rang, he was going to pick up the phone and answer it publicly? And the young woman set him up. And so they called. And does it, what, what was the setup for the poor professor? No, it wasn't somebody died, but close. She was pregnant. And it was a clinic calling with her pregnancy response. <laughs> right? And so, you know, if you have a policy like I'm going to answer it publicly, even though that one was a setup and a joke and just humiliated the professor, recognize that if you do that, something like that might actually happen. Right? So think about what you want your cell phone policy to be. Some of you may say no cell phones out in class. Some of you may say backpacks by the door. Quite frankly, I'm very Darwinian. Like if you want to text in class, go right ahead. On the test and papers, it'll show up, right? Um, you know, everybody handles those things differently, but you might want to let them know right ahead of time what that is. What other kinds of things might you want to put on your syllabus? Technology requirements. In what way, Lene? Um, for instance, the question I'm teaching students will be asked, do you as Marshall for a bill to put in? So they can do that via iPhone or you know, a number of other resources, but they'll need to know that in the beginning of the semester in case they don't already have one. Exactly. Right? So if you're going to have students film something, right? If you're going to have them create a health campaign, right, or create a political commercial, and they may not be thinking about that, give them time to get that way. The same thing like when I teach my capstone course. I have to let students know you will be required to do your presentation in professional attire at the end of the semester. Why do I have to let students know that? Exactly. There might be some students who don't have professional attire. And I've learned that I have to spell out what that means, that professional attire is not the same as what you wear to a party on Thursday night, even if the dress is really cute. <laughs> right? And so I, I put in the professional guideline attire from the Career Center. So think about anything you think that those students need to know ahead of time. And you can add sections um, in, that, um, in the OIRA resource where you create your syllabus. You can add sections. It's very intuitive. It's a wonderful little system. OK. So we've kind of worked through what has to be on the syllabus. And now I want to take one small step back here. Right? In order to create your syllabus, you kind of have to know what the class is that you're teaching. Okay? And so you might say, this is really easy. I'm going to be teaching on kind of, you know, what was the name of your class? Cybersecurity and Cyber Warfare. Well, that's easy, right? Like, eh. But, I, I don't mean that, but like the, the title tells us what's going to be in the class, right? But the question is, what is the student's background? Who am I teaching to, right? Are my students going to be freshmen or seniors? Because are you going to teach differently to freshmen than you would teach to seniors? Yes. Right? Are you going to be teaching differently if you have majors in your class versus non-majors in your class? Yes. Right? Might you teach a class differently if you have a lot of international students versus a lot of students who were born and raised in the United States? Yes. So you need to look at your roster, see if you can figure out who's registered in your class. It has their level, you know, the year that they're registered in. It has their age, or not their age, um, their level in school, um, even their hometowns. And for some classes, 
it might be important to know if you have mostly in-state students or a mix of in-state and out-of-state students, right? So for your topic, who are your students? What are their backgrounds and prior knowledge levels about your topic? And also, I'm sure many of you may know this if you were students here, um, but in your faculty tab, you can also see pictures of your students before they show up on the first day. Have you all seen the photo rosters? Okay, so you can also see photo rosters, so you can kind of start learning their names before they ever walk into the class. Okay? Then you have to figure out what resources do you have at your disposal. If you plan on teaching um, with PowerPoint and lots of media, even on the first day of class, you need to make sure that your classrooms are equipped for that. Go visit that classroom, turn on the computer, make sure it works, make sure it will allow you to link to the things that you want to link to. Make sure that those resources are there for you. Okay? Obviously, you should know your course content, and as we talked about, your learning objectives and outcomes, and you wrote some of those down. But, and I alluded to this a little earlier, but for me, this is one of the most important things possible. You've got to know what you really, really want and expect your students to walk away from. If the best answer you can give is you have to know this because it's on the test, you have failed yourself and your students. You shouldn't be teaching just to have them pass questions on a test. Yes, we have to test. Yes, we have to grade. But there should be an underlying reason for that. There should be a body of knowledge you want them to know. And I know that when I was teaching when I was your age, I was awful. Because my idea of teaching a class was, I've got a textbook and I'm going to go chapters 1 through 15. And I'm going to take the key information out of each chapter and I'm going to use a pre-printed test that they give me and I'm going to randomly select 10 from each chapter and there is my exam. And it must be good enough because somebody wrote, you know, that course teaching manual and they're the ones who wrote the questions for the test so they're smart enough to write the book, they can write the test questions. Was it easy to do it that way? Absolutely. Did it actually make any real sense as a teacher? No. And I would have questions on the test that when I look back, I'm like, wow, that was really crappy of me. That wasn't one of the key things I wanted them to learn. It was one, not even one of the things I focused on. Why would I just have randomly done that? Because it was easy for me. And I'm asking you today as you're planning out your class and your syllabus to really think about what do you want them to know. Right? Now, if it is something that they need a lot of little details on, then that's okay to say, hey, I know the book is overwhelming, but you actually need to know every bit of it. That's different from saying I want you to be able to tell me what's in the third paragraph of chapter 3, you know, on page 18, just, or, you know, 81, just because I want to see if you can do it. Does that make sense to everybody? Right. So think about that, okay? So every class should have key takeaway principles. Figure out as you're writing your syllabus, what are yours? What are the things like the phishing scam, like being able to critically assess media, like being able to do a political campaign? What can you do to reinforce those principles? You can have them on the syllabus. You can remind them in class. You can lecture on it. You can point out pictures in the book. You can use examples. But what are the variety of ways you can hit those messages home? Can you find ways of making that material relevant or important or tangible to students? What can you do to make that information relevant to them? And you can be creative here. Think about what you would have wanted when you were learning this subject. My oldest is in 10th grade, and last year he's kind of a science kid. He decided to take Latin. And um, I knew that he liked Latin because he's very, I knew he'd like it because of the science thing. He's now thinking about doing languages and linguistics because that Latin teacher has been so phenomenal for him. And what did he do? He immediately started bringing in history and he, he, archaeological digs artifacts that he had found. And so, you know, it's a dead language, but let's look at some of the things that this culture produced. And he made that subject real. So it wasn't just doing the, you know, the irregular and regular verbs. 
he found a way to bring that to life for the students in a language that's no longer even spoken. Right, so what kinds of things can you do to reinforce that, to make it relevant, and to make sure students are really getting what you want out of that class? Because here's the thing I think sometimes we forget when we get overwhelmed. When we're balancing being a student and a teacher, and I see at least one parent in this class, and some of you are going to be working other jobs, it's easy sometimes to forget that we're teaching in a subject area that we love. We wouldn't be teaching it if we didn't want other people to learn it, if we didn't love it ourselves. So think about what brought you into your discipline and what you want to communicate with other people about it. So putting it all together, like I said, visit the class that first before your first day. Bring your own markers, by the way. If you have a whiteboard, don't let anybody convince you that the markers will stay in there. Go to Target right now and buy your own pack of whiteboard markers and keep them with you. They walk away. Okay? Know how you're going to distribute your syllabus. Blackboard Learn is the easiest way, and you can pull it up in class. Um, but if you're going to do a paper copy, you know, make sure you have them printed ahead of time. Be prepared with an introduction. Okay? That first day of class, don't just go and go, hey, here we are. It's art history time. Woo! Be prepared to let your students know about you and what you want them to know about you. And this is what I'm going to say is really critical. How many of you did say it's the first time you've ever taught? Raise your hands. Should you tell them that? No. no. I know it's Shark Week, but don't let them out of the tank, right? You need to start by saying, you know, if I was a first year master, or well, I guess it could be a first year, second year master student. Hi, my name is Carol Mills. I am thrilled to be teaching this course. I have a background in communication studies from my undergraduate and graduate work. My research interests are in blank. You don't have to tell them that you've never published anything. Tell them what your research is. Establish your credibility. Tell them what your area of interest is. Do not tell them that this is your first time teaching. Okay? Um, put key information on the white or blackboard. Right? Get them involved immediately. If you have an icebreaker, note cards, introductions, something to get them involved. And the two most important things to me. That very first day, how many of you have gone to classes and they let you out the first half hour? and then you leave. Don't do it. Use that time wisely to begin a content introduction. So in this course, we're going to talk about, because again, that reinforces what the class is about, and it sets the expectation for them that you love that topic, and you're going to take it seriously, and you'd like them to do the same thing. And finally, say goodbye to the students as they leave. Don't beat them out the door, right? Let them know that you look forward to seeing them. Ask them if they have any questions. Invite them to your office. Those are the things hopefully you can do in that very first day and in the weeks now that you have to, or the week you have to prepare before class. Any questions? Thank you all very much. I know you have another workshop to get to. Thank you.